Romans chapter 18. Nicholas, 
experienced the same thing. You see, they would pile taxes on us that the locals would never have to pay. When it came to our paperwork, it was always at the bottom of the stack. And when I had to turn in paperwork, well, they would turn through the pages looking for you know, a bribe or looking for something. But nonetheless, I had realized that that government was ordained by God. Now, when it comes to authorities, I've divided those into three categories. And I've talked about number one, and that's government. Well, we find that the government uh, is, first of all, those that are ordained of God. Look at another reason why I must obey government. Look at verse number four. For he, government, is a minister of God to thee for good. And if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth the sword. For he beareth not the sword in vain, for he is the minister of God to avenge, to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Back in Genesis 9, for lack of time, will not turn there. But God spoke about the sanctity of life and that man then was given the responsibility to uphold that view that God had on life. And so when we think of government, well, human government was established by God. And so it's really not human government. It's really ordained a government that God has given man the responsibility. Now, government, what's it? Uh, uh, what is it? to do. Well, it's going to always be accountable to God. Whether or not they accept that or not, that is up to that particular government. Uh, that particular government. And do you know that nothing happens that God is not aware of? <laughs> nothing happens that God is not aware of. Well, I'll tell you, that's easy for me to say, but it's hard for me to live on Monday morning. Why? Because things happen in the world that... Uh, that uh, doesn't necessarily go my way. And so government is there uh, to uh, rule as God had ruled to be done. So what does that mean? Well, government has to be based on a justice system. Some governments are based on what man thinks is justice. We believe that God's word is the source of justice. And so therefore, we have to base what's just on what God has said. And so as we think of uh, human government or government, what is our responsibility? Well, I give you the reference, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13, 13, 13 and 14, and it is to submit. The yes, there is to submit. Peter would later say, submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to kings as supreme, or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him for the punishment of evil rulers, and for the praise of them that do well. For so is the will of God that with well doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. If I were to ask you a synonym for submit, what might that be? What, what is a. Okay. To obey. That's the word I was looking for. I said that, but that's right. It would be to obey. And you know that that means then that for any government law, this country or in other, I have a responsibility and that is to, to obey. When we think of human government, certainly they are there. As First Peter chapter three says that they are there to uh, restrain evil. They are also there to, as I mentioned, to protect the sanctity of life. And also, they are there to maintain justice. I think we're all aware of the sad fact that government today, and I can even speak of ours, is a rare thing for justice to be based on God's word. It's based now on what man thinks is right. Man's become a, a, um, an authority to themselves. That's the basis of humanism. So when it comes to government authorities, well, we have to pay taxes. You know, Jesus was asked a lot of questions, and sometimes he didn't answer. Now, this one time, we wish that he wouldn't have answered. <laughs> because the Jews asked him, do we have to pay taxes to Rome? What did he say? Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar and to God the things that are God. So, yes, from the top to the bottom. I had experience in Peru. I was there with a... Uh, a good friend of mine, we were visiting some missionaries, 
And the last Saturday that was there, the national pastor as well as the missionaries, he said, well, listen, you need to go visit some of the sites. We're in San Paulo and uh, it's a big city. And uh, we're going to send some of our young people with you. They want to speak English. And so we're going to let them go with you. They're going to be your interpreters. They're going to be your tour guides. And so here uh, are two tickets, one for you and one uh, for your friend Jim. Well, we asked about the, the young people. I said, well, they have a pass. They're going to use their pass. And so when we got to the subway, and the first time we got to the subway, they, they said, OK, take your ticket, put it into the turnstile, go through the turnstile, pick up your ticket. It was good for all day. Well, as we got to the turnstile, we did that. And the, the nationals, they jumped over. <laughs> well, we didn't think much of it. We got to the next turn side. We did the same thing. Ticket in, they jumped over. My friend Jim says, listen, when we get to the next turn, the turn side, let's jump over. And I said, yeah, you go first. <laughs> <laughs> well, finally, we asked them on the subway, why are you jumping over? We see their ticket was... Uh, time sensitive, but also event sensitive. They had so many passes on their, on their ticket that they didn't want to use them so they could use it another day. So we asked them in their broken English, well, why do you do that and why can't we? Well, the answer was, was well, if they're going to recognize you, they won't recognize us. You see, I wasn't about to jump over the turnstile. I don't think that I could. <laughs> the fact is, is that even they should have put their ticket in and used their ticket. Now listen, I would be a hypocrite if I were to say that I didn't think about it, nor would it be right for me to say I always obey the laws of the land, because they don't. But the fact is, is that when Peter said, I'm an inspiration of God that we are to submit, we are to obey our government authorities. The second category that we have of ordained authority is then that going to be of the church. Now, there's a couple blanks there, and I need your help. When we think of the authority of the church, the S is our shepherds, our pastors. God has placed authorities in our life. They're known as our shepherds. The second authority we have is the word of God. And also... The next is the body of Christ, and the E is elders. You know that I have a responsibility that God gives to us, the shepherds, the word of God, the body of Christ, the elders. What's my responsibility? First Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12 and 13 says, And we beseech you, brethren, to know them which labor among you and are over you in the Lord, and establish you, and to esteem them. There's the E. To esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake and be a peace among yourself. So when it comes to the authorities that God has given to us, particularly the human authorities, we are to esteem them. The word esteem means to consider, to respect. So within the global church, we have a responsibility there as well. You know, that means the preaching of God's word, the teaching of God's word. I am under authority. Everyone is under authority, whether or not we accept it or not. But the fact is, is that within the church, we have a, a, a chain of command. So administration of the church, the decisions uh, made for us, and the doctrinal issues as well. And so we have a responsibility, and that is to esteem it, that is to consider and to respect it. And then the third area of ordained authority is the family. What do you suppose the P stands for? Yes. Uh, parents, parental. All right, every child here, we've all been a child. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1. Children, Children obey. Obey. obey their parents in the Lord, for this is right. Ephesians chapter 6 and 2. Honor thy father and the mother, which is the first commandment. And you know that I can still honor my mother and father. My mother passed away 12 years ago, my dad 10 years ago. I can still honor them. You know what? Because I know what they wish. I know what they want. And so honoring never ends. Honoring always will continue for the rest of our life. You know, as I would speak to young people, 
many of the young people would say, you know what, my parents aren't saved. Do I still have to honor them? And I would say, yes, you do, because the Bible does not put an asterisk on honoring your parents. Honoring always will be part of a child to their parents. And listen, we've all been share, uh, children, and we all have parents. And so we still have that responsibility to honor. And you know, the Bible doesn't put an asterisk there that says that they're Christians or if they're living by God's word. You see, honor is a responsibility that I have for the authority that God has placed over me. You know, my unsaved father, and I didn't have it, I'm just giving an illustration. My unsaved father or mother will have more life experience than I until I surpass the time in which they die. So when it comes to life experience, yes, they might have more experience, but when it comes to Bible knowledge, listen, those young people that I taught at the Christian scholar, a college, they certainly have more Bible knowledge than some of their moms and dads. And so in the world of life experience, it's certainly they have more life experience. But when it comes to God's word, sometimes a child, uh, a college student, even a, a teenager might have more Bible knowledge. But nevertheless, we are still to honor them. Another category is that of husband and wife. Family authority. Ephesians chapter 5 and So what authority do we have in that regard? Well, loving and respect is responsibility. I've given you really three, honor, respect, and to love. So that would be the first category of responsibility. I refer to that as ordained authority. The second one, capital B, is what I refer to as delegated authority. All right, if ordained authority is what God has chosen for me, there's going to be delegated authority that I give to others. And you can see that it's the, it's the authority that I choose to place myself under. All right, so what would be some examples of delegated authority? Work, school. Of, of school, work, uh, an employer. Uh, I used to wear a striped shirt. White and black. I was a referee. Well, I had authority there. Now, the girls that I refereed, I used to do the guys, but I couldn't keep up with them. So I went to the girls and I couldn't keep up with them either. So I don't referee anymore. But you know, wearing that striped shirt, now they just wear a gray shirt, but nevertheless, it's more of a time. You see, I had authority on that court. I could call fouls. I could. Uh, called technical class. I had the authority to blow a whistle. Listen, they chose to play basketball. They didn't have to. Sometimes they wanted to quit after I called the two many fouls on them, but nevertheless, I was an authority. You see, those are delegated authority. Hey, can I go down to Walmart and in their aisles start passing out tracks? No, I can't do that. You see, there's no soliciting. So as I shop at Walmart or wherever I shop, there is an authority that I delegate to them, and I have their responsibility within that sphere in which I place myself. There's an authority because positionally I've appointed them. You see, that's why I think as employees, we have a responsibility to those who are our employers. Listen, for me, that causes me then to accept them in a way that I place them as an authority that God has placed over me. See, because I choose to place myself under their authority, I have a responsibility to them. Well, the question then, Roman number two, that I really wanted to get to, and that comes to make an appeal to our authorities. Make it an appeal to our authorities. First of all, the purpose is, when would I need to make an appeal to an authority? Everyone is uh, under authority, governmental, church, employment, or even in the home. And occasionally there are authorities or situations that we find ourselves in that we have to appeal to an authority. How does one proceed when under authority and expect to be submissive or comply with the directives of that 
authority. One must be able with a godly appeal to make to their authorities. First of all, the purpose is number one, when asked to do something wrong. When would I need to make an appeal to an authority when I'm asked to do something wrong? It was mentioned in Sunday school this morning about a corporate party. That happened to me long ago. It was 1981. I was working in uh, Atlanta, Georgia, really doing uh, higher education. And I was working for a Chevrolet company, Nally Chevrolet. Well, come Christmas time, there was going to be a Christmas party. And it was told, well, at the Christmas party, you're going to get your Christmas bonus. Well, not only was I told that a Christmas bonus was coming at Christmas, I also knew that at that Christmas party, uh, there was going to be an environment that I was not going to want to be part of. So I went to my uh, sales manager who sent me to the, the man in charge of sales, and then he sent me to the owner, Mr. Natalie. And I told Mr. Natalie, I said, Mr. Natalie, I'm very, very uncomfortable. Thank you so much for providing a, a Christmas bonus to us. But I would like not to attend the Christmas party because of the environment that was going to be there. And he looked at me and he said, well, are you willing to sacrifice your bonus? I had to think about that for a while because what I wanted to do was I willing to compromise in order to have the bonus. It was just a turkey anyway. But uh, <laughs> I felt like a turkey. And so, well, I had to decide. You see, in my opinion, or in my view, there was a conviction. There was a conviction that I had that he was asking me to do something that I knew was wrong. How do I know that it was wrong? Well, I give you the reference, chapter, chapter 4 of James, chapter 4, verse 17. Therefore to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not to him, it is sin. Now listen, this has to, if you write anything there, you have to say it has to be a conviction. Now what is a conviction? How would you define a conviction? What's a conviction? Something you're willing to die for. I've heard that too, Katie, and I think that's so true. Something that you're willing to die for. However, do you know that a lot of people have died for some foolish things? Yes. <laughs> so, we, it's something that we're willing to die, but what are we going to base that conviction on? What doesn't change God's word? Now, what's the difference between a conviction and a preference? See, a lot of times we confuse the two. A preference is something that I hold. A conviction is something that holds me. So when it comes to a conviction, it has to be based on God's word, not something that I hold, something uh, that doesn't come from God's word. So first of all, when asked to do something wrong, Daniel was asked to eat food offered to an idol. Was there anything intrinsically wrong with that food? Probably the best of the land. But nevertheless, by Daniel taking that food, he was tantamount of saying that idols were right. So, first of all, when asked to do something wrong. Second of all, number two, when authority is doing or about to do something wrong. When authority is doing or about to do something wrong. The example that I have is 1 Samuel chapter 25, Abigail. Mm -hmm. Abigail had a husband. Remember his name? He was the foolish husband. The foolish Nabal. king. Nabal. Fool. And the story has it that David was protecting Nabal's uh, herds. And he sent a messenger over to Nabal and said, Listen, my men are hungry. We need food. Give us food. And Nabal said, who's David? Now listen, he knew who David was. He was playing the fool. Well, David comes back, and listen, I'm not here to speak against David. He's a much greater man than I would ever be. But David is angry. What's he going to do? He's going to go kill David. Abigail satisfies David's anger. How? By a meal of food. And an amazing Example. Why? Because Abigail knew that David was going to do something wrong. Murder is always wrong. Older New Testament. Whether or not it's justified or not. The fact is, is that Abigail is a great example of this. Why? Because she knew that uh, David was going to do something wrong. 
How did the story end? I was able to die some heart attack. God does it. God brings judgment. And so when you know that your authority is going to do something right or wrong. Hey, can I say that these principles are so important that we need to teach them to our sons and daughters, to our grandchildren. There was times in our life raising children that I had made a mistake. Only one, but nevertheless, I made a mistake. <laughs> the fact is, is that Cree knew that I was wrong. You see, when I would come home and I would see all the toys and all my tools and everything all over the yard, I assumed that I knew which child it was, who had done that. But you know that one particular time I was wrong? See, with our four kids, actually the third, or the fourth one was so small, he really wasn't involved. When I would come home, I just knew it had to have been Andrew. Because he was always the one that would leave everything all over. Well, I had the wrong son. But listen, I, I figured out a better way. I'm just going to discipline them all. No, no, that wouldn't be right either. <laughs> and so Corinne would say, Fred, you've got the wrong son. You've got the wrong boy who's done that. And you know, she appealed to my authority. And so the fact was, is it even works within our own home? Thirdly, and probably the most common, when you disagree with an authority. When you disagree with an authority. As, as I would teach this to college students, this one would, I would, would, would say sometimes, kind of backfire for me. Because oftentimes a student will disagree with the teacher. But you know, with a godly authority, and I'm going to show you how to do that in just a moment. The fact is, is that I would give a grade for a paper or for a project or for a test. And oftentimes the student would say, you know what? That's not the test I deserve. Now what do you suppose? They wanted less or more? <laughs> they wanted more. And you know, after I taught this, this the, the phone would ring and the student would come to the office and say, Mr. Carlson, you taught us how to appeal to an authority. And I think that I deserve a better grade than what you have. So, you know, the fact is, is that they would appeal to an authority. Why? Because they disagree. You know, the Bible gives examples of this. Exodus 32 and Numbers 14. Both involve both Moses. The first one, Exodus 32, Moses appealed to God. It was the time of the golden calf. What was God going to do to Israel with the golden calf? He was going to kill them all, destroy them all. And Moses appealed to God when God was going to kill the nation of Israel. When they followed Aaron, they built the golden calf. The second time I find this is number 13, uh, 14, Moses again. Moses appealed to God for God not to destroy the nation of Israel when Moses struck the rock uh, when he was told to speak to the rock. Listen, God is not changing his mind. But nevertheless, it is an example of appeal when we disagree with an authority. And you know, it is so important for us to teach this to our sons and daughters and for us to be able to apply it within our home. Why? Because we are all under authority. We have authorities that are over us. And the purpose would be when we know what we're asked to do is going to be wrong biblically. Why? Because it's a conviction. Or because we see our authority doing something wrong. Or when we simply disagree. Now, how do we go about making an appeal? Well, that comes then to the next point, and that's capital B, the procedure. The procedure. Sometimes I say these are uh, the prerequisites. And the first is the right standing. And so the S is standing. The right standing with an authority. Here's what I mean by that, the right standing. If I'm going to appeal to my employer that he's asking me to do something that I have a conviction about, I have to be a good standing with that employer. employer. Listen, if I've been bellyaching the whole time that I've been working there, if I'm always late for work, if I'm not a team player, if I'm not doing what he is expecting to me, expecting of me, do you suppose that I could go to him and ask him to make a concession for me? And so I have to be in good standing. The same is going to be with God. Listen, as God asks me to do what uh, he requires me to do to be obedient, I have to be in good standing with him or uh, the authorities that I have over him. Psalm 62, uh, 66 verse 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the 
the Lord will not hear me. An example of this is in 1 Samuel chapter 15. You know the story. Saul, King Saul, appeared to Samuel and to God when the Philistines invaded Saul's kingdom. But his appeal, Saul's appeal, was not considered because Saul was disobedient. And he had not waited for Samuel and, for, and, and, and went ahead and offered the sacrifice himself. And so first of all, we have to deal with insanity. And listen, before I make an appeal to that authority, I have to make sure that I'm in good standing. Is there going to be reason for them to reject, reject the appeal that I made? Is there going to be reason for me not to be heard? Is there going to be a reason for them to think he's just belly aching just as he always has been? So first of all, am I in good standing? Second of all, number two, the right timing. The right timing for the appeal. Is my authority free to concentrate on my appeal? Husbands, fellas, don't do it when the baby is crying or when supper is late. That's the wrong time. Wives, not when your husband comes home from work or needs to unwind himself. You see, timing is always important. Will your authority see that you really are willing to sacrifice for the appeal that you're making? My Bible example would be Esther. Esther in chapter 5. Esther waited until the evening dinner to make her request. Esther was willing to sacrifice her life for going to the king uninvited. Esther had no will of her own and was willing to die. What did she say? I perish, I perish. You see, the timing was important. What would happen to someone who would come in the presence of a king uninvited? They could be killed. But timing was important. Esther waited for the proper time. Uh, thirdly, the right response. Right response. I don't have this written down, but listen, this is something that you want to remember. And that is the response to your appeal when it's rejected is the highest test of your true attitude. When your appeal is rejected, it's going to be the highest test of your true attitude, the right response. You know that I've gone to people and asked for them to consider my point of view, and sometimes it goes contrary to what I was asking. Well, how do I respond? Well, I have to be grateful. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for giving me your time. I know that you see things that I do not. I know that you're much more aware of what's going on than maybe what I am, but we have to be gracious. If my appeal is accepted, I have to be grateful as well, willing to follow through with any suggestions. My example, I think, would be da Daniel. We just sang about it. Daniel did not want to eat the king's meat, and so what did he end up eating? Uh, vegetables. Now listen, vegetables are great, right? Most young people say, nah, no, not really. The fact is, is that he had to then uh, be satisfied with the vegetables. And so Daniel would be a good example. He did exactly what the king had said. Number four is the attitude. The attitude for the appeal. Selfish motives will soon be discerned by our authorities. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 1 says, a good name is to be rather chosen than great riches and loving favor rather than silver and gold. Abraham appealed, Genesis 18, Abraham appealed to God for Lot's safety based on God's reputation, not on Lot's survival or for uh, Abraham's existence, but for, for God's uh, reputation. Moses turned God's wrath away from the nation of Israel by appealing to God's reputation. And so the true attitude. We have to be concerned with the authorities that God has placed into our life. When it comes to those that are doing evil to us. Now, I like the story of David and Goliath. Do you know that David faced Goliath not on the basis of the nation of Israel, but he represented the true and living God? Wow, what a great testimony as to the true attitude that we should have. See, David could have 
certainly justified God helping him defeat Goliath on his own behalf. Why? Because he had brothers that were soldiers. He could have done it on the behalf of Israel. Why? Because he was an Israelite. But his true attitude was on the authority by whom he found himself under, and that was God himself. And so concerned with our right attitude. And then finally, number five, the right wording. We don't have time to turn to Esther, but let me read some of the words that Esther had at that meal. You see, it's a very important idea to make an appeal when it goes against an authority. And the right wording is also important. Listen to what Esther says. Then Esther the queen answered and said, If I have found favor in thy sight, O king, and if it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition, and my people at my request. I see three things in regards to the right wording when it comes to making an appeal. Listen, this can work within a church, it can work within a family, it can work within a secular organization. First of all, the words have to be uh, a humble. O king. Now he was not only the king, but he was what? He was also her husband. And so it appeals to her, him at his highest level, O king. So first of all, words have to be humble. Se humble. Second of all, they have to be gracious. If I have found favor in thy son. Humble words, gracious words, and then honest words. If it please the king, let my life be given me at my petition. I want you to go to one last reference, and that's going to be the book of Numbers. Numbers chapter 27. There's a story here of five daughters. Their dad's name was Zelotah. I always like to have a name like Zelotah. <laughs> you know, to see each other, you know, very back home. I was always C. I was always up front. Zelotah. I want to read the story to you, and then I'm going to give you really the way in which that this came in. You see there, they changed history. Zelophe had, had five daughters and they changed history. And what they changed was not God's mind. We're never going to do that. But what changed was the policies that God had instituted for the children of Israel. You see, ladies, back then inheritance was only through the male gender. There was nothing for the ladies. Now, if that lady still had a father, she would have an inheritance that was his. If she was married, of course, she would have her husband. But Zelophehad's daughters uh, were five, and he passed away. Let me read the story. Numbers chapter 27. Then came the daughters of Zelophehad, the son of Heber, the son of Gilead, the son of Melchor, the son of Manasseh, of the families of Manasseh, the son of Joseph. And these are the names of his daughter. Milha, Noha, Hoglet, Milka and Tirzah. And they stood before Moses and before Eliezer, the priest, and before the princesses of all the congregation by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Our father died in the wilderness, and he was not of the company of them that gathered themselves together against the Lord in the company of Korah, but died in his own sin and had no sons. Why should the name of our father be done away from among the families? Because he had no sons. Give unto us, therefore, a possession among the brethren of our fathers. And Moses brought their cause before the Lord. And the Lord spoke unto Moses, saying, The daughters of Zelophe had spoke, had sp <laughs> Zelophe had speak right. And thou shalt surely give them a possession of an inheritance among their father's brethren. And thou shalt cause the inheritance of their fathers to pass unto them. You see why they changed history. First of all, they go to the authority. Who was their authority? Well, the authority, of course, was God. But under God, there was Moses, and then there was the high priest, Eliezer. Now, what they did, first of all, is they came, and they asked to have their appeal to be considered. And listen, I'm not going to walk into the office of my boss, hypothetically, and say, listen, sir, I'm going to have a word with you. Nothing is going to change. Matter of fact, he's going to probably demote me if that be the case. And so I have to ask if there is an opportunity. 
You know, I would have a student come to me, uh, maybe a young lady, and she would say, Mr. Carlson, you taught me the principles of appeal. My mom and dad are taking us on vacation, and they want to go to such and such a place, and I know it's such and such a place, I'm just going to feel uh, out of place, I'm going to feel uncomfortable, what should I do? Whatever the situation was that the student was asked, I always kind of turned up the same answer. I would say, get on the phone, text your dad, see him in person, and say, Dad, there's something that's important that I didn't talk to you about, and it involves you and me. Listen, if you text your dad, he's going to come right away. If you call your dad, he's going to speak to you. You know, it does involve uh, us and that authority. And so, as I would make that appeal to Mr. Nally at Nally Chevrolet, I said, Mr. Nally, there's something that is important that involves you and I. Is there a proper time for me to see you? And so an appointment was, was uh, set up. And so first of all, they asked for their appeal to be considered. State the importance involves you, <coughs> that it involves you and them. Second of all, re reveal the situation. Here was the situation. Their father, Zalopa, had to die. He wasn't with those that had died when the earth opened up and swallowed in Korah. But the fact was he died of natural causes. And so you reveal the causes. We have no husband. We have no brothers. Numbers, Deuteronomy, they're about ready to go to the promised land. We have no inheritance. And so they stated the problem. They recommended a solution. They suggested an alternative to be considered based on uh, the situation. Here, what they did, here is what they did. They simply said, would it be possible for us to have an inheritance when we get to the promised land? So they recommended a solution. They then had to wait for a decision. They had to wait for an answer. You know, in a family situation, I wouldn't necessarily suggest this, but I think in many other situations, you need to leave that office with an understanding of what do I do? Do I call you or do you call me? You see, as a student would come to me and appeal a grade, or as I would go to uh, an employer, I would want to know when is the best time for me to get an answer, when can I hear from you. My wife was a nurse, or is a nurse, and when she started working at Pensacola Christian, she was an employee of PCC. And because of that, there were many uh, benefits that we got because we were both employees. One of those was is that our kids in um, elementary and great uh, elementary school and high school, they got free tuition in the academy. When it came to college, they got half tuition because we both were employees. We're making a long story short, the uh, president, Dr. Horton, decided that uh, the medical facility was beyond their control. And so what they did is they hired Baptist Hospital to come and to be the supervisor, actually to run the clinic. Well, my wife and another lady were the only two PCC employees that had been grandfathered in. Well, we got a phone call, or we got a, a message from uh, her, her, her supervisor, who was PCC uh, boss, and uh, it came down that the benefits that we had grandfathered in was uh, no longer going to be part of uh, her pay package. And so that meant a great deal of, of loss on our part, but also did, uh, in inconvenience in as well. She told me, and uh, we prayed about it, we thought about it, and uh, here was the bright idea. I said, well, it's your job, you go talk to the president. <laughs> and she went through her supervisor, he went out the chain, and finally got to the president. Who did he get it one night? That's when we had the phone on the wall, you remember? <laughs> the phone on the wall. Uh, hello, Dr. Horton, president and founder of the college. Uh, yes, she's here. I had the phone to Kareem. And uh, long story short, he said, uh, uh, well, actually, I, I skipped the part. And that was is that Kareem made an appeal to her authority, and that was is that we have the proof that Dr. Horton grandfathered us in as long as she worked for the college. So Dr. Horton called her at supper time, and uh, he said, you know, we made a mistake. We will give you those uh, benefits, which were important to us. So those benefits continue. You see, the process of making an appeal 
was important. I can't say that we didn't gripe. I can't tell you that we didn't fret. I can't tell you that we didn't grumble about what decision had come down. The fact was is that we made the appeal. Couldn't make the appeal to her boss, and that went up the chain. It went all the way to Dr. Wood. And Dr. Wood realizes we made a mistake. You're going to be grandfathered in. And so you wait for a decision. And then lastly, you have to accept the decision. The highest test of your true attitude is how you respond when your appeal is rejected. I'm watching the clock, and I know that it's all almost, uh, it is time to go. I want to tell you about my son, Jeremy. My, Jer my son, Jeremy, was uh, an athlete, all of the kids were. And uh, his speci specialty, really, was long distance running. When he was uh, a sophomore in high school, uh, he took up, like his brothers and his sister, a pole vaulting. Well, to run the track on pole vaulting, uh, many of the, the, the athletes had spiked shoes. That gave them a better grip and allowed them to run faster. But also, many of them had uh, spiked shoes for their distance running. And I told Jeremy, I said, listen, Jeremy, you're going to run two miles, you're going to run one, one mile, and you're going to run in those spiked shoes. They have no cushion, you're going to end up injuring your legs. It's not the thing for a long distance runner to have those spiked shoes, track shoes. And uh, he said, okay, I'll, I'll accept that. Well, then he came to be a junior. And uh, he said, hey, Dad, listen, I have all the money. Can I go buy my track shoes? See, he wanted spike shoes. I said, you know, there would be a benefit for that, for the pole vault, for the runway, for you to get better speed. But listen, for long distance running, I'm going to buy you a pair of flat shoes, the ones that are needed for, for uh, long, long distance running. And uh, I had to tell him he was disappointed. Well, now he comes to be a senior. He's not pole vaulting very much. I mean, he does kind of uh, half-heartedly, but nevertheless, he's becoming uh, a good distant runner. Matter of fact, he was the ninth fastest two-miler in the state of Colorado his senior year. Uh, he would have been eight, but he discounted, uh, and he didn't push to be number eight. For eight, he got a trophy. <laughs> he just said, good job. But nevertheless, he became uh, a good uh, distant runner. He came to the senior year and he said, Dad, I want those spiked shoes. And I said, Jeremy, they're not for distant running. And I could tell he was disappointed. But you know, he appealed to me on the fact that, okay, Dad, you know best. Do you know that what that did in my heart? I said, Jeremy, let's go buy your shoes. You see, I was willing to hear his appeal. I was willing to change my mind. I said, Jeremy, listen, I want you to use those on the, the pole vault uh, runway. I don't want you to run them on, on the distant one because you're gonna hurt your runway. And you know, he made an appeal. I can't tell you how many times an appeal has come across, so to speak, my desk. And I don't know how many times an appeal has been made that I've made an appeal. And it's not always answered the way that I want it to. But nevertheless, the Bible gives us the responsibility that I have for the employees in my life. Okay, in wrap up, what do we what responsibility do we have as believers for governmental authorities? We're to pray for them. We're to honor the king. When it comes to the church, what responsibility do I have? Well, we're to esteem them. Why? For their work's sake. And when it comes to the family, what responsibility do we have? We're to love and to honor to cherish those within the home. Now listen, let me be honest with you. This is easy for me to teach, but it's hard for me to live. And it only can be done with God's help and God's wisdom. I've just touched the surface. I've gone very, very quickly. But I hope I've given you some insight that you can help, and some Bible examples that will help us to understand this all the better. Father, thank you so much for the opportunities that we have put into practice the principles of God's word. Father, today we've been challenged to take a stand for that which is right. How to live amongst our peers that are really living ungodly lives. We know that we are to be a light of this world. That you want our lives to be that of salt and light. Help us to be wise as a serpent and harmless as a Give to us the courage and the boldness. Give to us the wisdom that our words are seasoned with salt. We've also had the opportunity to, to look at, uh, at the, the 
faults of not recognizing uh, Christ. Give to us a desire to draw near to him. And now we've looked at this all-important topic and principles of the authorities. Father, well, help us not to buck authorities. Many of us are in authority and help us to realize that we too are under your authority. Give to us a new outlook. Give to us the principles of God's word to live by. And we'll be careful to give you the praise. In Christ's name I pray. Amen.